Hello, everyone, and welcome to Open Observability Talks. I'm your host, Dotan Horvitz, and here at Open Observability Talks, we talk about anything DevOps, observability, and open source. So may the open source be with you. <laughs> and uh, Happy New Year, everyone. This is the first episode of 2023, and uh, we've got a whole new look for the episode for those remember the the yellow theme uh, theme so uh hope you like it and uh do let me know uh on twitter at open observe or at orbit i also just got the end of year podcast statistics from spotify and i'm glad to share that we have listeners from over 40 countries uh we have more uh, than tripled our followers 270 percent increase and several hundred listeners ranked us in the top 10 podcasts so Thank you so much for joining me on the show throughout the years and uh, for following us and giving us high ranking. And uh, the show is available on all the popular podcast apps, not just Spotify, so uh, as well as YouTube, if you want to watch us chatting. Uh, so if you haven't uh, followed yet, do uh, go ahead and join us. I'd also like to thank our sponsors, Logs.io, the cloud-native observability platform. Logs.io takes the best-of-breed open-source projects such as Prometheus, OpenSearch, uh, and Jaeger and offers them as a unified observability platform built for scale. For those joining the live stream or on YouTube or Twitch, uh, feel free to share questions and comments on the chat. This makes things much more interesting for uh, me and the guest. And let's move on to today's episode. Today, I'd like to talk about Kubernetes monitoring. It's astonishing how much data is emitted by Kubernetes environment and how complex its monitoring can get. And it's time to talk about the unspoken challenges. So I invited uh, Alexander uh, Valialkin, uh, CTO of Victoria Metrics and the veteran of the monitoring world. He uh, is also uh, the creator of the Victoria Metrics open source monitoring solution, which we'll also discuss today on this episode. So I'd like to uh, invite 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 uh, Alexander to the stream. Hey Alexander, how's it going? Hello everybody. Uh, great. Uh, let's talk about uh, challenges in uh, Kubernetes monitoring. I'm ready to talk about this. Yeah, we we actually we had an interesting chat a few uh, months ago at uh, Open Source Monitoring Conference in Germany, and uh, I'm really glad for the opportunity to have this. Uh, uh, fireside chat with you on the on the show today and um as, as i presented also uh the opening uh you live and breathe metrics and, and monitoring so maybe can you tell us a bit about your experience with monitoring kubernetes as a practitioner and uh the challenges that uh, that you've encountered yeah um, our users users of victoria metrics uh frequently monitor uh, Kubernetes and Kubernetes applications. And that's why uh, I'm aware of uh, various issues uh, which are related to this monitoring. And uh, let's uh, start with uh, this uh, enumerating and discussing these issues. Uh, and the first issue is the Kubernetes itself. <laughs> I mean, that <laughs> as a Kubernetes uh, popularized uh, microservice architecture uh, instead of uh, monolith architecture. And uh, when you monitor monolith, uh, there is only one application, a monolith, and uh, it, uh, public, this application exports some kind of application metrics and system metrics. And uh, the number of such metrics uh, is fixed. Uh, and uh, if you split monolith into many microservices, uh, then every microservice uh, uh, need to export its own set of metrics, uh, system metrics, I mean, uh, CPU, memory, uh, network usage, and so on. And also, uh, every uh, microservice uh, needs to expose its own set of application metrics. And additionally, on top of this, uh, every microservice should expose uh, communication uh, metrics, I mean, uh, metrics uh, related to the communication between microservices. Uh, latencies, uh, RPS, and so on. And uh, so when you switch from single node application to microservice application, uh, the number of metrics uh, explodes uh, <laughs> many times, 10 times and more. 
and uh, since uh, uh, Kubernetes popularizes uh, microservice architecture, this means that when you move to Kubernetes from uh, plain old uh, hosting providers, uh, hosting services, um, you usually start to exposing start exposing many more metrics. And, uh, this... I think there's also a point maybe worth mentioning that it's also the the frequency. Like uh, it's not just that we break the application into many yes. uh, many uh, microservices. It's also that each one has its own life cycle. It's releases. Obviously, uh, making it smaller and more agile means more frequent releases. And that uh, that's uh, a major contributor as well uh, to the to the uh, to the aspect, right? Correct, correct. Uh, <laughs> the next uh, major contributor uh, to the metrics uh, charm and uh, the metrics uh, cardinality is, uh, as you said, uh, uh, frequent deployments in Kubernetes. And uh, with every uh, deployment in Kubernetes, uh, um, new instances of uh, pods are created and every pod in Kubernetes has its own unique name which uh, doesn't intersect with uh, the previous names of uh, such pods and if uh, this uh, pod name is included in uh, as a label in metrics exposed by this pod this means that uh, with every new deployment uh, old metrics uh, stop uh, stop receiving new uh, samples and uh, new metrics appear and uh, start receiving new samples and uh, such situation uh, means uh, is named as uh, char rate and if uh, this uh, redeployment uh, occurs frequently uh, this leads to high char rate situation when um, old metrics are substituted by new metrics i mean time series at high rate and uh, this high rate uh doesn't it's it worth mentioning because what, what you're talking about usually the the pod name is is one of the labels right that you uh, you refer to and then uh it, you get the new time series essentially right just to make sure that the the listeners understand the the challenge here and what's what's changing if you can elaborate yeah, more. because uh, every time series uh, in every monitoring system is uniquely identified by its name plus a set of its labels yeah, and if uh, one of this label value changes, uh, then new time series is created. Exactly. That's why uh, new uh, uh, so, so the physical, the yeah, so sort of the physical, if you can say physical and pod, but the physical pod disappeared, the new pod was spun up to carry on the, the workload. But if, if, if uh, the design by design, if they design it by using the, the pod name that uh, it, it creates a new time series. Maybe uh, this is the, yeah, the source of the the pattern because uh, oftentimes people result to the pod name rather than maybe looking for more uh, something that will will be more consistent across uh, the pod life cycle, which is the, the actual logical workload, right? What, what did you find useful in that respect? Um, if we look uh, in Kubernetes deployments. Uh, uh, there are uh, rep replica sets, uh, and uh, <laughs> I didn't remember uh, in the, uh, when when you uh, uh, and stateful, stateful sets. And uh, if you use uh, stateful set deployment, then uh, every uh, pod uh, has a consistent name naming. Uh, this name uh, consists of uh, the pod, the original pod name from deployment, uh, plus uh, uh, numeric. Uh, the number of this spot uh, from zero starting from zero to the number of pods you deploy in a stateful set and uh, these names uh, stay uh, static and don't change when you redeploy new uh, deployments in uh, stateful sets and this means uh, that such naming uh, doesn't introduce a churn rate up during the deployment but, so, so uh, the pattern that you found is to, to just use the replica set or the uh, stateful <laughs> set as the the one that carries on across the uh yeah, the this, this, i would say that uh, this can be used as uh, some kind of hack to use uh, stateful set uh, abuse <laughs> stateful sets for uh reducing char rate but i think that uh, the general solution uh, should be implemented by uh, kubernetes developers itself uh, they should provide uh, such uh, some stable uh, labels for uh, usual deployments, uh, not uh, for replica sets deployments. So uh, we, as uh, monitoring solutions, uh, could use 
uh, these stable labels instead of uh, pod, uh, pod name which uh, changes with, with each deployment. And this uh, will all redu reducing, just eliminating uh, the churn rate in uh, Kubernetes. Yeah, sounds interesting. Yeah, that, that's what I was refer referring to, like by, by logical name, because I think replica set or stateful set is not the, it's, it's a hack, as you said, but uh, maybe the ability to attach a, a logical name that will carry on will be more of a, a permanent set that can, can be interesting. Um, and and uh, I think there is an interesting uh, common uh, a comment here from uh, uh, from the audience saying that UUID is a label uh, always. So another uh, suggestion here from the from the audience, the UUID. Uh, uh, the, but UUID also changes with each deployment. UUID is a unique ID of uh, any object in Kubernetes, and uh, this ID changes when you uh, redeploy some pods. Uh, because new pods obviously are different uh, logical objects compared to previous pods, and that's why UID also changes and also introduce uh, churn rate. So that's yeah. not solution. <laughs> the problem yeah. is to uh, fix uh, such uh, some to use some some fixed name per each pod, uh, which uh, doesn't change when uh, you de redeploy this pod. Yeah. I think another uh, point that uh, that uh, is worth discussing. You, 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 I think you mentioned that uh, briefly before. Is is the uh, the fact that you know when we have uh, Kubernetes. First of all, uh, Kubernetes itself is, um, I guess, a new uh, let's call it critical uh, system that we need to uh, now monitor. Uh, so we have uh, in a just like we need to monitor our. our, our Back in the days, that the bare metals were our critical systems, and obviously the, the operating system and things. So now we have Kubernetes itself, and lots of components, both on the node level and on the uh, control plane level, uh, the, the cube layer, the the, the K proxy, and and the, you know, etcd and whatever, and um, and also uh, it comes with a pack of uh, of uh, metrics on its own. Uh, one of the things that uh, is astonishing is, I think, the the number of metrics that you'd find uh, by just installing uh, the bare minimum, I don't know, a, a tiny uh, three-node cluster, and just checking the default metrics that come out of the box. If you just use all the all the defaults there, um, uh, I, I know that we've experienced that with with our uh, with our users uh, often that they quickly start running out of quota just be, uh, because of that. But uh, interesting to hear your uh, your experience with that. Yeah, uh, by default, Kubernetes uh, uh, exposes many metrics, and uh, let's let's look at uh, Prometheus operator or Victor metrics operator, which uh, are the, almost the same as uh, Prometheus operator. Uh, they uh, come with uh, additional components uh, for monitoring of Kubernetes, uh, such as kube state metrics, uh, node exporter. Um, and so on, uh, and they uh, collect metrics from different components you mentioned, in, uh, which are included in Kubernetes. And the number of such metrics uh, usually very big from the start when uh, you uh, monitor uh, Kubernetes cluster of, consists of consisting of uh, three nodes. Uh, you end up usually in tens of thousands of metrics uh, <laughs> in this cluster. Um, and we do the same, by the way. I, I, we, we have also an agent that is based on, on open telemetry and, and some other best practices on the open source. But you know, based on C advisor and cube state metrics and uh, and the node exporter, you get a gazillion of metrics. That that's uh, that's <laughs> pretty yeah. astonishing. And the issue is that uh, the majority of such metrics uh, isn't used anywhere in uh, dashboards. They aren't used in dashboards. They aren't used in uh, alerting rules or recording rules. And uh, according to Grafana study, um, it has been appeared that only 25% of uh, these exposed metrics uh, are used, actually used. And 75% of these metrics uh, are never used in anywhere. So it is possible to just uh, reduce a lot on your monitoring system by four, at least by four, four times by removing uh, these unused metrics. <laughs> that's, that's actually astonishing. Like 
you say that only like 25%, only one fourth of the metrics uh, that, that are exposed uh, by the default, as we said, is actually put to use from, from what you see. Yeah. yeah, that's correct. And I think that uh, the, uh, there is a way to improve uh, this situation. And I think that I believe that uh, the proper way is uh, uh, the Kubernetes uh, developers should think uh sit at the table and think uh which metrics uh, uh they need to expose and compose uh the set of essential metrics for exposing uh from kubernetes components and create some kind of standard for these metrics uh, and uh, this standard should uh, describe where these metrics uh, should be collected and uh, this metrics should be exposed by uh, Kubernetes components, uh, which are included in every Kubernetes installation. So uh, third party monitoring solutions should not uh, install additional components for monitoring Kubernetes itself. Because right now uh, you need to install additional components as uh, you mentioned already, you should install uh, C advisor, uh, node exporter, cube state metrics. Uh, these uh, components aren't included in Kubernetes itself, this uh, third party components. And I think that uh, the, all these metrics from such components should be included in uh, Kubernetes itself, and Kubernetes should uh, expose these metrics. And this, uh, the set of these metrics should be carefully uh, maintained, I mean, the list of these metrics. Uh, and this list should not uh, contain uh, metrics which aren't used every, uh, anywhere. <laughs> Well, that, that's that's actually a, a tricky question because uh, I wouldn't expect m most of my users, at least the one that I uh, that, you know I encounter and I talk to, uh, and we see also in, in my company, don't really know what they need, and uh, usually they just go for the defaults because that's the safest uh, bet and just bringing everything and then seeing. So I think, and and also it, it's not static; it's it keeps on growing. I think one of the most Astonishing uh, uh, stats that I, I, I saw uh, was that since I think you brought it up also in, in the early discussions, like since 2018, the amount of metrics exposed by Kubernetes has increased by three and a half times. That that's astonishing. That means that it keeps on growing in, in an immense rate, and expecting the end users to keep up with this growth uh, is, is very difficult. And uh, I think this is where we as uh, as a community and uh, obviously the the community leaders which is the vendors and the open source uh, uh, the, the kubernetes uh, uh, sigs the you know the uh, special interest groups and and the relevant working groups maybe to help uh, provide guidance on some of what is uh, uh, used or not for example we since there is no such standard we at uh, at, at uh, Logs.io, for example, curated the list uh, that, that is, is open source, obviously. It's a, it's part of the Helm charts that we provide. And you have the list for um, for both the Kubernetes out of the box and also for AKS, CKS, GKS, all the managed versions of the uh, uh, Kubernetes to, to recommend at least what we find uh, useful amongst our users. Uh, should you use a cube system, this or that, or, or DNS, cube DNS or others that like giving a curated list. But the question is, uh, if what we see with our users is similar to what you see with your users, and if we can provide some sort of an overall uh, overarching uh, uh, best practices for the entire uh, community and industry. Mm, I think that um, um, system kind of metrics, uh, which... Uh such as CPU usage, memory usage, network usage, such on, uh, and so on, um, can be uh, the list of such metrics uh, is uh, isn't too big, <laughs> and uh, it is quite easy to provide uh, such list of uh, uh, curated list of such metrics from uh, Kubernetes developers itself, uh, from Kubernetes developers, and to provide uh, such a single or multiple exporters in Kubernetes. Uh, in every Kubernetes installation, uh, which export uh, this system metrics. And as uh, for uh, application uh, level metrics, uh, it's a hard question because every application has different set of metrics. And as you, can, as you said, uh, uh, 
different uh, sets of users uh, need different uh, metrics and use different metrics from every application and it's uh, maybe hard to provide the curated list which fits uh, everybody and in this case uh, I, <laughs> I think uh, the way to go is uh, that uh, every application uh, such application uh, which uh, is used in Kubernetes uh, should provide uh, its own set of curated metrics uh, or uh, multiple sets for different use cases of the, the metrics. Um, well, that, that's an interesting question. I uh, I'm debating it myself. You know, again, as I said, we resulted to to having uh, on, on our GitHub repo uh, public uh, Helm charts with uh, with the best practices that we found. Uh, but then again, you have different. Um, uh, components in it, uh, obviously uh, ones that use cube state metrics, uh, Prometheus node exporter and others, and each one brings its own set of, of metrics. And the question is if these can't come with some sort of, of, of guidance, at least on my, uh, uh, on my sense of things. Um, but, but it's a question and I think it's, it definitely is something that is worthwhile uh, trying to at least open this channel of discussion um uh, between them and and also th that's on the standardization side and also on the tooling side to enable this removal of irrelevant uh, uh metrics and and maybe adding to the metrics themselves so there's a metric that might not be used altogether the que the other level that that i found at least uh, at least very useful is also removing labels because and that goes to the cardinality challenge. So many of the, the built-in metrics come with lots of labels, some of which are, uh, we found at least, less relevant. And the question, do you need the per core, uh, I don't know, CPU analysis, or is it fi fine for you to just get the overall CPU and things like that? And when you remove redundant labels, you dramatically decrease the overall uh, uh, load and volume because the cardinality reduces. Have you encountered something like that? Uh, yes. Uh, another example of uh, such labels is uh, histogram labels, <laughs> because uh, usually uh, a single histogram can introduce uh, hundreds of uh, new metrics, new time series, because of uh, a bucket label. Mm. Yeah, maybe just to explain to our audience before you carry on for, for the so the, there are different types of, of metrics like gauge and like a counter and histogram is the the more complex one because it actually is not one number being aggregated over time it's actually several numbers one per bucket uh, of, and then you get for each uh, point in time multiple uh, data points that are being collected and as you said this dramatically increases the the overall uh, data on that specific uh, metric. It's, it's one metric, but the type of metric being a histogram means that it collects buckets rather than a, a scalar, single single uh, number. Uh, so just, yeah, just I, explain the background, yeah. Uh, I think that uh, the solution, there is no uh, universal solution for this uh, problem, uh, but I think that the way to go uh, is that uh, every uh, developer who uh, develops uh, exporters uh, for such metrics uh, should uh, pay more attention to metrics uh, it ex uh, this exporter exposes and just should think twice before adding additional metric uh, to this uh, exporter and should think more about uh, which metrics or labels can be removed uh, without hurting uh, the observability of uh, this exporter this application yeah Sounds good. I, I see also a question from the audience. What do you uh, uh, guys think about exponential buckets histogram? Uh, do you want to take that? Uh, exp uh, you mean uh, the uh, histogram type, which uh, recently added to Prometheus? Uh, I, I suspect <laughs> that one. Actually, I think it's. Uh, I wasn't called. I wasn't sure if it's called exponential, but uh, 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 you're the, the expert. Uh, yeah. Uh, the Prometheus uh, his, new Prometheus histograms are uh, named native histograms, as I remember. Yeah, but that, that's uh, how I know use... them as native, yeah. <laughs> they use the exponential bucket histograms also. Uh, actually, uh, in Victory Metrics uh, histograms uh, also provides some uh, some kind of uh, um, histograms, and they also based on uh, exponential uh, bucket histograms, but uh, they differ in details between each other. 
And I think that uh, exponential uh, histograms with exponential buckets uh, are way, great way to use, uh, much better than uh, other uh, bucket types uh, for histograms, uh, because uh, you don't need to think uh, the bo about boundaries of these uh, buckets. Uh, these boundaries are created automatically, and uh, uh, you automatically cover uh, all the range of values for uh, measurement you measure with this histogram. Uh, and the main issue with uh, exponential uh, bucket histograms is that uh, the number of buckets uh, can be quite big. It depends on the uh, size of, uh, of on the exponent which is used for yeah. this uh, buckets. And if you set uh, too small exponent, then the number of such buckets can explode to thousands <laughs> or more. And this is also not great from performance uh, perspective, from resource usage of the monitoring system perspective. So you yeah. need to uh, keep some such balance between uh, the uh, accuracy of such histogram, uh, precision of such histogram, and uh, the amounts of uh, resource usage for this histogram. And yes. that's yeah. the most complex task <laughs> when using such histograms. Yeah. Um, and, and another point that I wanted to discuss is uh, it comes up especially when dealing with multiple deployments. So when you have a, a large environments involving many deployments in parallel, uh, and this is the configuration challenge. How do you configure these multiple environments? Uh, do you want to talk about uh, how, how you view this and how you handle this? Mm, yes. Uh, usually Kubernetes is used for... Uh, deploying um, multiple uh, different applications. Uh, this ends up uh, with uh, multiple de deployment configurations. Uh, then the number of such deployments, uh, different deployment configurations uh, can grow to hundreds or even thousands in uh, big Kubernetes clusters. And uh, currently, uh, open source monitoring for Kubernetes uh, uh, says that uh, every such deployment uh, should contain a uh, custom configuration for monitoring, uh, which ends up into Prometheus uh, script config, a single con Prometheus script config. Uh, such con uh, custom configuration usually contains some kind of uh, reliable rules, some, some kind of fi filtering for selecting uh, the needed uh, pods for this deployment, some kind of uh, configuration for uh, discovering the path where to scrape these metrics. Um, and if you have uh, thousands of uh, such deployments, then uh, this configuration for each deployment uh, for monitoring uh, can end up into a big mess. It's an uh, unmanageable mess, I say. It's hard to manage uh, such a uh, big number of uh, different configurations for monitoring. Uh, and another thing uh, is that uh, every such uh, configuration per each deployment ends up into a single script config in Prometheus, and such uh, every single script config in Prometheus generates additional load on Kubernetes API server, which is used for discovering uh, the needed uh, targets for scraping per each such uh, deployment. Um, so so people one. end up with separate CRDs and like for each and every one, it could be potentially hundreds or even more per, depending on the, the number of environments, right? Yeah, you yes. need to so, manage so, individually. Uh, yes. And so uh, this increases a lot both on uh, users who operate all this uh, stuff and uh, this increases a lot on uh, Kubernetes API server because it needs to uh, answer a uh, hundred times instead of uh, one time. Uh, when you have one uh, script configuration. And I think that the way to go is uh, to uh, to use some, uh, to devise some uh, standard for uh, server discovery in Kubernetes for deployment and pod discovery in Kubernetes on top of uh, server discovery which is used in uh, Prometheus. Uh, so uh, in most cases, uh, Prometheus or some other monitoring system uh, should automatically discover uh, all the 
uh, deployments, all the pods uh, which need to be scraped uh, to collected metrics uh, without the need to write custom configuration per each deployment. And uh, uh, only if uh, in some exceptional cases when you need to uh, customize something, then you uh, can write uh, this custom uh, resource definition for scraping. And in most cases, uh, it should work out of the box without the need to write custom configurations. And I think that uh, this way to go and uh, it will remove uh, the maintenance burden from operator of the Kubernetes and also re reduce uh, the lot on uh, Kubernetes API server. Interesting. So you see that as something that is uh, out of the box. You, you, uh, which part do you think that users should uh, should configure, and which part you should? Think uh, that they, uh, yeah, I think I think that they shouldn't uh, configure anything uh, in ideal case. Uh, their applications, uh, which run in pods. Uh, should just expose metrics uh, in a standard way in Prometheus uh, exposition format, for instance, uh, at standard well known uh, uh, paths and uh, TCP ports. And that's the way to go. And in this case, uh, the monitoring system can just uh, scrape, uh, discover uh, all the ports in the Kubernetes and just uh, scrape metrics from well known uh, endpoints. That's the way to go. And uh, uh, actually, uh, Prometheus operator and uh, Victor Metrics operator uh, support uh, such kind of scraping, uh, which is close to uh, this ideal situation. Uh, this uh, scraping configuration can be configured via annotations in deployments. You can say that please uh, 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 scrape metrics from <laughs> these uh, pods, which uh, uh, from this pass and uh, this pods uh, from this port and the, this. Uh, uh, configuration is written in annotations in every deployment. So this, that's better than uh, writing custom uh, resource definitions uh, for metric scraping per each uh, uh, deployment. But I think that uh, the even best solution is to just uh, adhere the some kind of standard for metric exposition in uh, Kubernetes pods and. In this case, you don't need to write anything uh, metric related uh, into your deployment configurations. And uh, the monitoring system should just discover all, all these new pods and discover metrics on these pods uh, without the need of uh, additional configuration from users. So uh, actually, there is a, there is a question here from the audience isn't the this the future uh isn't the future in otlp protocol otlp being the open telemetry protocol do you see that as part of the roadmap uh, on this path or maybe i will add to that question from the audience if you see that within the open uh, metrics uh, format or how do you see that mapping to existing uh, open sp open specification mm, uh, i think that uh, as for metrics uh the main, uh, the easiest solution is to use uh, Prometheus text, text position format or open tele, open metrics. Uh, it is named open metrics yeah, right now. Open metrics. Uh, this uh, uh, metric exposition format uh, is uh, very easy to implement. It's very easy to debug because it's just plain text and everybody knows how to read it, familiar with it. Um, as for open telemetry, I think that uh, uh, it can be used for uh, collecting traces, probably uh, or logs. Uh, I don't know. But as for metrics, I think uh, I see that uh, open telemetry is uh, quite complicated compared to simple open metrics format for for metrics. <laughs> so yeah, I, I think that yeah. that's the main stumbling block for open telemetry uh, adoption for metrics. Yeah, I, I think it's, uh, it is, by the way, in, in the uh, roadmap of, of open telemetry, it's not just for logs and tracing and definitely aiming for uh, for uh, metrics as well. And there's lots of work also with uh, Prometheus uh, uh, projects and the working groups to, uh, to uh, uh, create the synergy between the two specifications. So uh, definitely, uh, I think that 
it, it will be interesting to see how uh, uh, the open telemetry specification also addresses that but uh, i guess it, we will have to live and see that um uh, I, I want to um uh, there was one more point that uh, you mentioned about the lack of common scheme also to enable correlation, which is also related to that uh, that aspect. Yeah, uh, this is actually related to open telemetry efforts because uh, open telemetry pro, uh, uh, popularizes uh, the common standard for uh, uh, telemetry data collection. Uh, so. Uh, and the, and the one of the main points for such standard is uh, to ease uh, the correlation between different kinds of uh, collected metrics, traces, logs. So I think that that's also a way to go to improve the situation in a Kubernetes world. Yeah. Um, so I think we discussed and we also said that uh, you mentioned about the uh, try to create to. I guess collect in a uniform manner the the two aspects, both the system metrics that are I guess more a close more closed set of of metrics and also the application metrics. Uh, do you want to add anything about the uh, what you see lacking in the in the collecting in a uniform manner? Mm, I think that uh, the system metrics in Kubernetes, uh, such as uh, CPU usage, memory usage, uh, network usage, disk I/O usage. Uh, can be collected uh, from Kubernetes, uh, from Kubernetes itself, or from uh, pods which run in Kubernetes, uh, can be collected uh, in a uniform for, uh, format and uh, can be standardized by Kubernetes, uh, can be write, written in some standard of Kubernetes. <laughs> and there is no uh, any additional uh input from uh, users because uh, this uh, system metrics uh, are uh, constant across uh, every application every pod and uh, there is no uh something to invent here in this area so uh, these metrics uh, should be i mean system metrics in kubernetes should be collected by provided by kubernetes itself and collected uh, from Exports uh, which are provided by Kubernetes itself. Uh, that's, uh, I, see, I, mean, I think that it's uh, easy to solve a task. As, and as for application kind of metrics, uh, every application, uh, yeah, every application uh, exposes different uh, sets of metrics, and uh, it is hard to create some kind of standard which can. Uh, group this uh, metrics from different applications in some form. So uh, I don't know <laughs> how to solve uh, this issue. Yeah, I think there's also aspect of what uh, goes back to what what's needed because um, many of the metrics that are exposed are not, I find, not actionable. And it really depends also on the, on the platform. For example, if you compare, if you go to the managed Kubernetes, for example, when you uh, collect uh, system components, I don't know, uh, Azure Defender, for instance, uh, you, you're pretty much probably collecting the the uh, system metrics will be useless for you as an end user because you don't manage uh, the underlying system anyway. So it's not actionable for you. So And still, you can find these metrics exposed by uh, the managed Kubernetes uh, nonetheless. I guess they, they didn't filter it. So what I find is that really... Um, focusing, it goes back to also focusing on on um, on the relevant metrics, also in the aspect of standardization. So, per the environment that you work, uh, managed Kubernetes environments should also provide their own uh, exposed set that is relevant to their end users in a way that will will focus instead of uh, defocus uh, us as, as uh, consumers of this service. Yeah, uh, agreed. Uh, but I, uh, <laughs> I mean, I meant uh, that uh, there are system metrics uh, uh, which are ex related to every pod in uh, which you deploy in Kubernetes, and uh, these system metrics uh, are relevant uh, in any kind of in any environment of Kubernetes environment because you uh, every user <laughs> should uh, uh, take care about. Uh, 
resource usage of the deployments in Kubernetes, the ports in Kubernetes. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no, sounds good. Sounds good. Uh, I want to uh, uh, switch and, and talk a bit about uh, your journey with uh, Victoria Metrics. Uh, it's a very, uh, very interesting open source in the field and uh, quite, quite uh, widely uh, used these days. So um, interesting to hear you started actually uh, yourself as practitioners working with Prometheus and uh, you said you actually had great improvement, especially over uh, Zabbix back in the uh, in the previous day. So, what what drove you to start uh, developing another solution? Mm -hmm. um, yes, uh, as a previous work, uh, we started using uh, Prometheus, and uh, we were very happy with Prometheus compared to Zabbix because we were using Zabbix before. Uh, the main uh, feature of Prometheus, uh, which we liked, is that uh, developers uh, can add as many as they want metrics to the applications without the need to uh, talk to uh, DevOps and say, please add this metric to my application. <laughs> this is the way to go, the way uh, which we, uh, we were using in uh, Zabbix era. Uh, that's great. That was great. but. Uh, uh, when we started using Prometheus, uh, we end up in a uh, very big number of metrics, and uh, at, the, at the time uh, there were no, there was no Prometheus two zero. There was uh, Prometheus one point something, and this Prometheus uh, couldn't keep up with the increased amounts of metrics, which we happily <laughs> uh, fit it uh, even on uh, pretty beefy uh, hardware. And that's why we started searching for uh, improvements, how to improve uh, Prometheus. Um, it's important to note for the listeners that are not aware, Prometheus by design is, is a, a single node installation. So it can scale obviously vertically if you add more memory, more disk, whatever, but it can't scale horizontally. So you can't do, make it into a clustered solution. So that's that's the limit, I guess, that uh, that uh, native Prometheus offers. Yeah, and around the, the same time, uh, we were uh, we started using ClickHouse uh, instead of Postgres. Uh, the previous work, we uh, were collecting uh, Analytic, uh, huge amounts of analytic stats for at, at server, and uh, this stats uh, was storing uh, was storing in uh, Postgres uh, initially, but the Postgres also couldn't keep up with the amounts of data stored to it and uh, the queries over this data, and we uh, discovered uh, ClickHouse at the same time, and when we tried ClickHouse and uh, we discovered that it can handle. 100 and even more thousand times more lot on the same hardware than uh, Postgres and additionally ClickHouse can scale to multiple nodes and this was <laughs> very great experience um, so uh, I decided that uh, probably we can use uh, ClickHouse architecture the ClickHouse technology for metrics collection for metrics processing uh, so that's uh, how Terametrics has been appeared. <laughs> nice. By the way, we, we in, in a previous episode, we also hosted the uh, founder of Signals, which is also based on, on Click, ClickHouse architecture, very fascinating open source ClickHouse. And uh, we can talk about it in uh, more in, in different episodes. But I, I'm curious actually to hear. So uh, uh, so you, you found yourselves need, liking the Prometheus uh, concept, let's say, and then many of the features, but you needed to lack the scalability. Uh, in fact, here on the show, we covered uh, several open source projects such as Thanos, Cortex, and M3DB, which aim to tackle the same challenge of the scalable uh, Prometheus. So I I'm curious, how is Victoria Metrics different? Yeah, Victoria Metrics, <laughs> the main difference between uh, Victoria Metrics and uh, other systems on the market, such as Thanos, uh, Cortex, or Mimir, uh, is that Victor Metrics uh, is written from scratch. It uh, doesn't use uh, any source code from Prometheus. And uh, other systems, Thanos, uh, Cortex, uh, and Mimir, uh, are based on uh, Prometheus source code. They reuse it 
that's the main uh, difference between these uh, systems. Uh, uh, another difference is that uh, Victorimetrics stores uh, data on uh, ordinary uh, disks or uh, block devices. I, I mean, and uh, Thanos and Cortex started uh, from storing the data to object storage. And uh, both solutions have uh, pros and cons. Uh, the main pros of uh, uh, block, uh, storing data to ordinary disks is that ordinary disks usually have much smaller uh, latencies, uh, much smaller error rates, and much higher bandwidth compared to object storage. Th uh, this helps uh, improving qu query performance comparing to object storage. Uh, and the main disadvantage of uh, the local disks compared to object storage is that the local disks uh, have limited uh, space capacity, and uh, you need to uh, manage uh, resize uh, some kind uh, to think about how to resize uh, these disks when you your storage will <laughs> sh uh, shrink. And um, Victory Metrics uh, can scale to multiple nodes in this, uh, for solving this problem. So if you uh, fill a single uh, disk uh, in with Victory Metrics, then you can add more uh, storage nodes to Victor Metrics, and in this case, you will get more uh, storage space. And ad uh, additionally, uh, some uh, local disks, such as uh, Google Persistent Disks or Amazon uh, block storage, uh, can be resized on the fly. You can just uh, add more space to existing disks uh, without the uh, restarting of the application. Nice. So, can you give us just some figures to understand the scalability that you're you're talking about with Victoria Metrics? Recently, we uh, run a benchmark uh, in which in this benchmark we uh, were ingesting uh, 100 uh, metrics per second into Victoria Metrics cluster uh, during uh, 24 hours, uh, and uh, these metrics were collected from uh, real node exporter, Prometheus node exporter component. Uh, these metrics weren't generated uh, randomly. <laughs> so uh, this benchmark uh, uh, was very close to uh, production data from, from collection, collection site. And uh, in this benchmark, we discovered that <laughs> Victory Metrics can scale to such a uh, huge workload on data ingestion pass. And this uh, benchmark was running, I didn't remember, uh, uh, was used around uh, 100 nodes, different kinds of nodes in uh, Victoria Metrics cluster was used in uh, well, for running this benchmark. And the total number of CPU cores was uh, around 1,000, as I remember. Nice. Yeah, I remember actually we went from, from uh, OSMC from Open Source Monitoring Conference uh, in Germany. That was uh, pr pretty uh, astonishing numbers and the, that you shared there. Um, one point that I wanted to ask is that, um, you know, many of these solutions started as, as a long-term storage for Prometheus. I think that you with Victoria Metrics took some a different approach. At least at some point you, you started uh, I guess, diverging or extending beyond the Prometheus ecosystem, both in the PromQL query language with extensions and with, with APIs. Do you want to say a word about uh, where you're heading with this? Mm, yes. Uh, as you said, we start, uh, initially we started as uh, a remote storage for Prometheus. Uh, and later uh, we stumbled uh, with some uh, issues uh, with Prom in Prometheus ecosystem. Uh, the first issue was um not so good support for a remote read protocol from Prometheus side uh, when we uh, created uh, Victor metrics as a remote storage for Prometheus we were thinking that uh, Prometheus could uh, use Victor metrics as a storage and uh, all the queries uh, can go to Prometheus and Prometheus can uh, ask for the data from Victor metrics and uh, process this data and return the query response but it has been appeared that uh, <laughs> that's not uh, th th that was not working. 
uh, because of uh, different issues uh, i can later put you post you uh, links to, to these issues in prometheus uh, issue tracker and that's why uh, we had to create our own uh, implementation of uh, Prometheus query language. Uh, we started implementing it, uh, implemented it from scratch. Uh, so uh, you can uh, query vector metrics uh, on itself without uh, the help of Prometheus. And later, this Pro Prometheus query language implementation uh, has been grown uh, overgrown uh, from ql query language and uh, we renamed it to metric ql as this uh, sup superset on, on top of uh, prom ql i would say and uh, it also has some uh, incompatibilities with uh, prom ql and these incompatibilities are deliberate uh, this means that we are not going to fix <laughs> them this kind of incompatibilities because of uh, we think that our implementation uh, fits uh, users better than uh, Prometheus implementation. For instance, uh, we can look at uh, increase function implementation. Uh, if you use uh, executing increase function on top of uh, integer counter in, in uh, Prometheus, uh, you can be surprised when Prometheus uh, will return you not non-integer uh, responses <laughs> from, for instance, uh, you uh, want to get uh, the number of uh, requests for the last five uh, minutes, so you you write increase or number of requests for life five minutes, and Prometheus could return you one point five, for instance. <laughs> not, not what you'd <laughs> expect. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and, uh, uh, and also this... the rate function. I think there was also something. Yes, the rate there. function is uh, tightly connected to increase function, and uh, also. Uh, Victor metrics implements it quite differently. For instance, uh, when you use rate over a small time window uh, in Prometheus, uh, which is smaller than the uh, double of scrape intervals in Prometheus, uh, you get uh, an empty graph, an empty response. And Victor metrics uh, just returns what most users expect. It returns uh, the rate <laughs> for. Uh, yeah, there's also a question here from the audience. If you, uh, if you can uh, refer to uh, M3QL, the M3DB, I guess this is the language, the pro query language by M3. I don't know if you know it, if you if you can relate to uh, uh, this product. Uh, we mentioned a bit Thanos, Cortex, and Mimir, but if you uh, can say a word about M3, mm -hmm. a question from the audience. Mm -hmm. I'm aware of uh, M3 uh, database, and uh, as I, I know, it is also written from scratch. Uh, it probably it uses some kind of uh, Prometheus code. Uh, I I think that they use uh, Prometheus code for uh, query execution because uh, they declare that they are one hundred percent compatible with Prom PromQL. So if you want to achieve such compatibility, uh, the easiest way is to reuse the code <laughs> for yeah. query execution. So probably they use. Uh, Prometheus code for from KL, but uh, the storage layer is written from scratch, as I, as I know, in M3. Other from this... Uh, it's okay uh, if you don't know it. It's a, it's a question from the audience, but it's fair to say if you're not familiar, we, we're not expecting to compare with all the, the products out there. Uh, I, have a, I have a question that uh, also, because we talked about a lot about the, the storage, which is obviously you know, the time series database is the core, but uh it's not everything even in prometheus it's, it's prometheus it's not just a time series database it's, it's got a full stack including the scraping like the agent mode the, the alert manager front-end the ui and more so uh, from does does victoria metrics plug into that stack or provide a vertical full stack of its own mm, victoria metrics now uh, it provides uh, the full stack of uh, for monitoring it provides its own the agent component, uh, this component is like uh, Prometheus agent, <laughs> this lightweight agent which can uh, discover uh, scrape targets, uh, scrape these targets, uh, and it supports uh, the same configuration for scrape targets as uh, Prometheus. Uh, so you can switch from Prometheus to the agent and scrape uh, the same targets in the same way. 
uh, and additionally uh, we mentioned supports uh, not only uh, scraping metrics it also supports popular data ingestion protocols for instance it accepts the data from uh, uh, InfluxDB, uh, Graphite protocols, uh, Datadog protocols, and so on. Uh, also, we have uh, Vem Alert component. Uh, this the component is responsible for alerting and recording rules, uh, and uh, it also supports the configuration uh, from Prometheus for alerting and recording rules. And also, we have uh, other kinds of components, uh, uh, such as VMOs uh, for authorization, uh, multi-user authorization, uh, VM, uh, CTL uh, component, which is used for various uh, operations tasks, uh, for instance, uh, transferring data from one system to another system or uh, uh, checking health of uh, some systems and so on. Uh, so it's, it's a full vertical stack. So we're about to run out of time, but I want to obviously, uh, if you can share with the audience, how can people join the open source project and the discussion and, and get involved? Uh... Mm, yeah, we, we are very glad to see new users uh, in our community, in the Victoria community. Uh, we have uh, Slack chat, active, active Slack chat. Uh, we encourage you to join the Slack chat. Uh, I will post a link to, to it, or you can find it uh, when on our uh, Metrics GitHub page. Um, and we encourage uh, users, uh, new users, to use Victorimetrics to uh, file feature requests, to file uh, bug reports, uh, and uh, to send pull requests. Uh, we are very happy when the users send uh, even a sim very simple pull request which fix some typos in documentations, for instance. Uh, that's the starting point for new users in Victoria Metrics. Do you have other uh, community channels that you would like to highlight over Slack, Discord, or any other that you want to mention? Uh, I already mentioned Slack chat. So this is the yeah. most uh, active community uh, point for Victoria Metrics. We also have Telegram chat. Uh, you can also join if you use Telegram. And we, we have a Reddit uh, channel. Um, and yeah, so, so sounds good. And uh, obviously, they can, they can also reach out to you. We'll also put on the uh, on the YouTube description your your own uh, LinkedIn and, and Twitter so they can, people can also reach out to you directly. But I think the community channels are the best, uh, best way to go if people are interested. Um, I want to... Uh, um, uh, Thank you for that. And I want to switch over. We have just uh, one minute left. So I want to mention one uh, on, the, on, the, on the industry updates section. I want to just mention one very interesting uh, thing that I uh, just saw uh, a, few, a couple of days ago um, by, the, uh, by uh, Chris, the uh, CTO of uh, the CNCF that uh, wrote the uh, cloud native predictions of 2023. I found them very interesting. Uh, including uh, things such as the cloud uh, IDEs uh, becoming normalized and the uh, standardization of FinOps and uh, uh, WASM, uh, WebAssembly innovation and others. So uh, highly recommend checking this out. I'll put it on the resources page. Uh, fascinating uh, sort of predictions uh, listing that also is very aligned with what we see, what we discuss here on the show. And... Um, and the topics that we, we keep on discussing. Uh, very interesting on that. Um, I want to uh, thank you uh, again, Alexander, for joining me uh, on this uh, show and sharing your uh, your insights. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you for inviting for this talk. It was very interesting to take yeah. part. Thank you. And of course, uh, thank you to all our listeners uh, for uh, joining that, uh, us for the episode. Um, and. Uh, you, as always, you can find all the episodes uh, on the on your favorite podcast app uh, or on YouTube if you want to see that in the video video cast format. Uh, if you are listening to the episode on uh, on the uh, podcast, then do know that we stream the episodes live on Twitch and YouTube Live, so uh, you can find all the details about the upcoming uh, streams uh, on Twitter uh, at Open Observe. Uh, check them out for updates, or you can follow me at Horvitz, uh, where we update and share comments, and you can share your own comments, suggestions, uh, news bits, and everything else. Um, 
And if you have something to contribute uh, to the show, if you have something interesting, if you're a subject matter expert, uh, feel free to uh, reach out and uh, submit a proposal on the website, openobservability.io, where you can find all the details and also the CFP. With that, I'd like to uh, thank you. I'm Dotan Horvitz. Uh, thank you very much for listening. And we'll see you on the next month's episode.